and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB, and it's set spoil day. They have revealed the entire set of Dominaria United, and we're going to go over the rares and mythics, and I'm going to talk about what I would and wouldn't craft, or how many I would craft. It's a crafting guide combination set review built around standard MTG arena. So uh, you guys can watch it and laugh at me as I say really dumb things that turn out to be like completely true and correct three months from now, or the opposite. I say things that I think are brilliant and wonderful, and then I turn out to be brutally wrong. Yeah, that's that's what you love the most. I know you're gonna go back and watch this three months from now, and I'm gonna see the comment show up on my YouTube feed, and it's gonna be like, ha 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 ha, you said not to craft Winona Joiner of Forces. Ha! Yeah, I love doing these so much. It's fine. This is fine. Um, today's video is dedicated to Jeff Grail. Grail. Um, Patreon, thank you for becoming a token tier patron and your Shark and Wolf tokens are on their way to you. If you would like to become a patron, check out the link in the description and at tiers $4.99 and up you get a shout out in a video. So thank you very much, Jeff, for the support. And now we're going to begin because these always take a while. Starting with, I've got these sorted by rare, rarity, and then by name. So not by color. Tough beans. Uh, a dark har waste is the very first thing on the list. Four. I'll make it easy for you. But if you've never played with the Painlands, they are very good. They are playable in control decks, but you'd rather have them in aggro decks, to be honest, but you still play them in control decks. They're pretty much straight up four ofs. So they tap for a colorless or for a white or blue and deal one damage to you for the best one. What a great banger to start this particular episode. Next card, Aether Channeler, two and a blue for a rare human wizard, two one. When it enters the battlefield, choose one. Create a one one white bird creature token with flying. Return another target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. And, or draw a card. Yorian is gonna love this. This, oh, this card's a banger for me. I mean, at its worst, it comes in, it bounces something. It's a human, so the type is good. Wizard has been a type that's been used more as well. You can bounce your own things, which isn't always true on cards like this. And if there's just nothing going on, you can draw a card. I mean, it seems really good to me. It seems to fill a ton of roles. In standard, sometimes the format is so fast and there's so much going on that a card like this kind of becomes a kind of good in every situation, but master of nothing, it's just not powerful enough. When I look at this card and I think about Fable the Mirror Breaker and Wedding Announcement, I know I'd rather have those cards, but this card doesn't interact unfavorably you can come you can bounce the goblin token for example you can just draw cards if there's anything like a yorian or a blink deck which are the kind of effects that wizards continues to print because they love them this card is very good so what would you craft for this card look if you're a yorian gamer if you love the blink strategy like i'm probably going to be trying to build decks with four of these at some point this is like a four craft for cgb i think for the average player you can craft one for your historic brawl decks. You can craft two if you're really bullish on the card. I wouldn't go above two yet. Let the card prove itself. If, if this card really excites you, get two and see how it goes. All right. A Johnny Sleeper Agent. We've talked about this one on a video before. It's one because not everybody watches those videos. I'll read them again and then I'll say if my opinions really changed. One green Phyrexian white for loyalty completed, meaning that you can, you know, pay two life or pay mana. But if you pay life, it enters with two fewer counters. Plus one revealed top card of your library. If it's a creature or planeswalker, you may put it into your hand. Otherwise on the bottom, minus three, three plus one plus one counters among three target creatures. They gain vigilance until end of turn. Minus six emblem. When you cast a creature or planeswalker spell, target opponent gains two poison counters. 
poisonous kitty. I still want to do the Super Friends Poison deck, and that deck will have four Ajani Sleeper Agents in it because getting to that loyalty is probably going to be very, very difficult. However, as a recommendation on crafting this card, having thought about it, I think it's much closer to a sideboard card for very specific matchups in creature-filled tricolor decks. Therefore, it's so narrow, I actually am going to give this a don't craft for now because I'm not convinced. But if there is a three color deck that is really good at just getting a ton of bodies on the battlefield, I'm thinking, I'm looking at Wedding Announcement, I'm looking at Fable the Mirror Breaker, looking at Gala Greeters, cards like this, then this card can probably come down minus three and take over the game because those plus one, plus one counters are a huge boost and the vigilance means it's going to be almost impossible to race and very difficult to kill a Johnny. So uh, on, on the watch for this, in that deck, is a Johnny like a four of? No, it's probably a two of maybe a three of. So at, I think the ceiling for this is a craft three. If you love like Naya aggro, that would be my take on this card. Next card is Anointed Peacekeeper. This is two and a white for a 3-3 three, three Vigilant Human Cleric at rare. As it enters the battlefield, look at opponent's hand, choose any card, name, spells. Your opponent's cast with the chosen name cost two more to cast and activate abilities of sources with the chosen name cost two more to activate unless they're mana abilities. I feel like we've been here before. They rotated Elite Spellbinder, then they reprinted Elite Spellbinder, but with some key differences. I'd rather, in most aggressive decks, have a 3-1 Flyer than a 3-3 Vigilance, because the invasion is very important. But they also don't exile the card from your hand. It says spells your opponents cast with the chosen name cost two more to cast. If you have the Shuffler Special, which is two or three cards of the same card, so let's call it three Meat Hook Massacres. Anointed Peacekeeper can hit all of those meat hook massacres not only that anointed peacekeeper doesn't have to if i'm reading this right choose a card name that's in your hand you could play for the top deck you could name meat hook massacre if that's the only card that's going to beat you off the top when you look at their hand and see that nothing is very relevant right now obviously it's a little win more in that situation but if the meat hook was on top of their deck you just win uh the activated abilities of sources with the chosen name costing two more is brutal as well. I believe that can apply to Planeswalkers. Aren't those activated? Are loyalty abilities activated abilities? Now they cost two mana to activate. That sounds gross. Um, but in general, like naming Oni Cult Anvil could be very, very fun in the next meta where Anvil is looking like a dangerous little deck. So I'm I'm a buyer on Anointed Peacekeeper. I think that this is a very good card with plenty of flexibility. It's also, you can blink it to change it, which is kind of interesting as the game goes on. The opponent plays something with an activate ability and you flip the Anointed Peacekeeper to it. The They can stack if you clone your Peacekeeper or, make mul or draw multiple Peacekeepers. You can just lock certain cards out of the game if the opponent's looking at two or three of those in their hand. It's just brutal. I mean, white aggro is so popular. I don't know if this makes the cut in Boros, but it would be a good sideboard card for Boros, I bet. And white aggro decks have been so popular for the last few years. I just don't feel they're going to leave yet, especially since they can still play Thalia on two and this on three. So white aggro gamers, you're not out of it yet. You should craft four Anointed Peacekeeper. This card looks very good to me. Very, very good. Four. Next up is Anciado Dorso Pret Potato. I, hold on. Next up is Codename Ape of Industry. Two green, 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 Ape Shaman. Whenever you cast a creature spell, choose one of these. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Look at the top five cards of your library, put a land from among them on the battlefield tapped, put the rest on the bottom, and you gain four life. This is a 5-7 mythic. So, it says when you cast a creature spell, when this ape bro, or sis, whatever, enters the battlefield, it doesn't do anything other than be a five mana 5-7, five, which isn't the worst. That's, that's some booty on that ape. However, every creature spell you cast after that, destroy an artifact or enchantment, can be very good. I, I imagine this is very good in formats like Commander. In Standard, I'm not quite sure. The other, you know, get more land. How many more land do you need if you untapped with your five drop? 
I don't know. Gain four life is very powerful and stabilizing, but so is a five seven booty. This card strikes me as win more. I think one should probably craft this or order one of these for formats like Commander or Historic Brawl. But I think for standard, for standard, I'm giving this a do not craft. I don't think, I, I think it's a win more card for standard. Next up is Archangel of Wrath, a card that we covered before. Two white, white, three, four, kicker, black, and or red. Flying lifelink when it's kicked, two damage to any target. If it's kicked twice, it does two damage to any target twice. Um, the more I've thought about this card, the more I think it's a bit slow. It's a fine stabilizer against very, very aggressive decks, but I think it's very slow and not uh, significant against control decks. Um, very powerful in mid-range, so it might be a very good best of three card, and it's in the Angel Tribe, which is super popular, so I'm sure you'll play against it. But my honest recommendation on this card is don't craft. I'm not convinced it will be a serious player when the format settles, and I am I, I'm super skeptical of it. I see it ceiling kind of around a two or three of, you know, between deck and sideboard in the right mid-range meta. So I'm not ruling out that it will see play, but my advice is not to craft it for now. Astor, Bearer of Blades. I had to be able to call something ass, but like now that ass pirate is rotating. Now I've got Astor. But I don't know if this will see the same play. No, it won't. It won't see close to the same play. Two and a red-white legendary creature human warrior rare 4-4. Four, four. When Astor enters the battlefield, look at the top seven of your library. You may reveal an equipment or vehicle. Put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom in a random order. Equipment you control have equip one. Vehicles you control have crew one. Potential for card advantage if you can hit in the top seven. I mean, seven is a lot. But that's also a lot of equipments and vehicles in your deck. I like that it can hit bank busters. I like that crew one is pretty good. But the weird thing about the crew on the vehicle is you just made a 4-4. It can crew most vehicles anyway. The equipment having equip one can be solid. And there are some very expensive cards like Colossal Hammer in Historic slash Explorer that would love to equip for one. So I think that this card is going to see some interesting fringe play in larger formats, but in standard, I don't see it yet. They'll have to print equipments and vehicles that you're super excited about playing. And guess what? This is going to be the first review in years where the primary subject isn't good with the Sika's Chariot and good with Goldspan Dragon, <laughs> because those cards are rotating. So uh, I guess the Bearer of Blades is going to need some help besides the Sika's Chariot in Standard if it's going to really shine. I don't see it as a don't craft for me. Braids Arisen Nightmare is one black black 3-3 three, three legendary creature nightmare rare. At the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice an artifact creature land enchantment or planeswalker. If you do, each opponent may sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with it. For each opponent who doesn't, that player loses two life and you draw a card. I think this card has some potential to see a little bit of play in Anvil or something similar to Anvil, maybe a black white value tokens type graveyard recursion deck would enjoy braids arisen nightmare but in a very challenged three drop spot where there are a lot of good choices giving an opponent choices between you know whether or not they sacrifice a thing or whether or not you get the benefit and making a three three body that doesn't necessarily do something the turn that you play it and if they were to kill it at instant speed and forces you to sacrifice your own things in hindsight this isn't very promising to me i would like if you're, a, if you're a brewer, I would craft one and I would try it out in Anvil as a one of. I would try it out in like black white tokens as a one of, something like that. I wouldn't go all in on the Braids hype train just yet. Um, I think that it's going to be too easy to interact with, but I think it will be very fun for commander players. Historic Brawl players might also enjoy this card a lot. And I know that some of you crazies are gonna be trying to figure out how to sacrifice lands to try to force opponents to sacrifice lands. And you're gross, you're weird, but that's okay. We love you just the same. You're still cool, you're just weird. Anyhow, the card, I'm, I would probably give it a zero. I'm gonna give it a sentimental and cool factor one just 
try it in a few decks if it sounds like your kind of card, but don't craft too many. Briar Hydra, five and a green for a six, six plant Hydra at rare with trample with domain. It deals combat damage to a player, put X plus one plus one counters on target creature, or X is the number of basic land types among lands you control. Many cool things going about this card, but it's a limited bomb and it is a mega bomb in limited, but in standard it dies to doom blade and it's six mana. So we can move on. Do not craft. Caves of Koilos. Tap for a colorless. Tap for a white or a black. One damage to you. Four. High quality. High quality. You still play them in decks like Esper and such too, I'm sure. They replace Pathways very well. Caves of Koilos is a sweet one. Absolutely awesome to have it reprinted. Let's go. Chaotic Transformation. Five in red, sorcery rare. Exile up to one target artifact, up to one target creature, up to one target enchantment, up to one target planeswalker, up to one target land. For each permanent exile this way, controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a card that shares a card type with it. They put the card onto the battlefield, then they shuffle. Okay, that's a lot. I think that there's... <sighs> I, I was trying to come up with a way that you could make tokens, like say a soldier token and a food token or a treasure token, right? And then you cast this and you exile those and you get the one creature in your deck and the one artifact in your deck and those two cards together are a combo that can win you the game. I This sounds much more, you know, big format. This sounds much like something that just won't happen in standard. Chaos lovers are going to enjoy it, but it's a don't craft for me until somebody shows me a convincing I win the game combo with this. If you have one for standard or heck, even if you have some for historic brawl or commander, you can leave them in the comments if you want to. I would love to see what you would do with a chaotic transformation. The next card is Cosmic Epiphany. Four blue blue for a rare sorcery. Draw cards equal to the number of instant or sorcery cards in your graveyard. I love drawing cards. I hate sorceries. I hate six mana sorceries. If they don't say take an extra turn, I usually don't play them. So I'm giving this a zero. Danitha Benalia's Hope is four and a white for a four four legendary human knight. First strike, vigilance, lifelink. When this enters the battlefield, you may put an aura or equipment card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield attached to Danitha. Another card that is an awesome commander and awesome in big formats. Yeah, uh, just really good for auras and equipment style decks. If you get an aura or equipment out of the graveyard, it is like you got some card advantage with Danitha. It's a very expensive card. When you add in an aura or an equipment that is beneficial. It's probably a super battlefield stabilizing card, much in the way that Lyra was back in its day on Dominaria, when sometimes you would get in situations where the opponent was beating you to death and you had both played a little back and forth and you slammed Lyra Dawnbringer. And even though it dies to Doomblade, the opponent looked at their hand and Doomblade was not there and they just couldn't attack anymore. Danitha has some of that potential, especially when you look into the equipments or auras that could also be attached to her. So I'm not writing her off. I think that you could definitely see some play for her in standard before her time in the format is done. I'm probably on a do not craft basis with the card until we see the aura or equipment that we really, really want to use, that, that kind of standout card that pushes her over the top. And brewing around her will certainly be exciting for some people who enjoy that style of play. So if you know, if, if you are an aura equipment enthusiast, you should go try out Danitha right away. Um, for me, I'm going to sit back and wait. But I wouldn't be surprised if this card did have a big impact before the format was over, but it's a wait and see on the crafting guide for now. Defiler of Dreams is three and a blue blue for four three flying Phyrexian Sphinx. As an additional cost, you know what? We're just going to say I read this card before on a previous video. My take on Defiler of Dreams hasn't changed. This is still a zero for me. I, I find the 
requirement to be a permanent card, the real problem with the card. If it were any blue spell, you could drop this and then play your ops for zero mana and draw additional cards off your ops. And that would be really exciting. And without that, with it re being required that it is a permanent, I just don't see the card as a very promising card. So it's a do not craft for now. The white version of the cycle is Defiler of Faith. This is three and a white white for a five five Vigilant Phyrexian Human. As an additional cost to cast white permanent spells you may pay to life we're going to call it the phyrexian clause because it's the same on this entire cycle um whenever you cast a white permanent spell create a one one white soldier creature token i like this one a lot better than defiler of dreams because you often do have a number of white one drop cards However, you are getting into a mid game situation where these cards are sitting in your hand and you're paying life to cast them and it makes extra board, but is it enough? Um, this is going to be a very common theme with these cards that you kind of have to play them and then untap with them to really take advantage of the cost reduction. And they're already very expensive cards. And because of that, I, I'm not enthused about them especially the ones that cost five mana so for me defiler of faith is still a don't craft somebody will have to show me how or why this is better than other five drops in the format or just playing cheaper cards that are going to win the game before you have to cast your five drop the next one is defiler of flesh this is two black black four four menace phyrexian horror it has the phyrexian mana kind of stipulation thing whenever you cast a black permanent spell target creature you control gets plus one plus one and gains menace until end of turn i mean that hits really hard basically between this being menace and another creature on the board being menace after you cast a black permanent spell your creatures are mostly unblockable so this is a very strong aggressive card but it shares the issue which is you need to cast it and untap with it in most games of standard for it to be good. And I just, I, I would rather play something else. Competing in the four mana slots are cards like Soren and Henrika Demnathi that do things the turn that you play them. And I think that they win the spot over the Defiler of Flesh. Next up is Defiler of Instinct. Two and a red red for a four four first strike Phyrexian Kavu at rare. As an additional cost to cast red permanent spells, you may pay two life. Those spells cost red less to cast if you pay life. Oh yeah, the Phyrexian Clause. We established I can say that. Whenever you cast a red permanent spell, one damage to any target. This one's getting closer. For one thing, like one mana red spells are kind of a given in formats. Um, it does have to be a permanent spell, so it's not play with fire, but we saw like the Phoenix Chick you know, is is one card. Uh, Rabbit Battery is another. Cards that are seeing play. Kumano faces Kakazan, etc. Um, if you're curving out really well and those end up sticking in your hand, getting to slam them after you play this by paying some life instead of mana could be very strong. Um, the, the the one damage to any target is really good. We, we saw Mayhem Devil, that cards that can trigger this multiple times a turn, like, can be very dangerous. I'm... Still not convinced. It's it's like, man, what's it gonna take? I, I honestly think it would have to be a non-permanent spell. If you could, you know, cast a play with fire for free off of this and get extra damage, I think it would be a very playable card. The fact that it has to be a permanent is it, it is the tilter for me. But this one, I think this one is really close to playable. And Defiler of Instinct, if you wanted to try some things with Mono Red, I think you could mess around with this card. But it gives me pause because is it that much different from like Maniform Hellkite where you drop it on four and then if you untap and cast a few spells, it's good things happen. And Maniform Hellkite is one of the cards I was very wrong about last year. So I'm scarred and I don't plan to touch a Maniform like four mana have to untap with this to be good card so i'm still not crafting defiler of instinct but i feel like this one is close next is defiler of vigor which is the three the green green six six trample phyrexian worm and has that phyrexian text and whenever you cast a green permanent spell a plus one on each creature you control this is another card that's very dangerous um the body itself is intimidatingly large and powerful and if you do start growing your creature count by casting spells it can get out of hand very very quickly it still feels too much dies to doom blade for me too slow wrong format at least standard i i'm not getting any of the defilers in standard i'm just 
I'm giving a zero to the cycle. I hope I'm wrong, but they just seem like they're going to be too easy to interact with and a little too slow. The next card is Drag to the Bottom, which is two in a black, black domain sorcery. Each creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is one plus the number of basic land types among lands you control. So it's, if you, I, I'm going to be looking at this a lot from a perspective of building control decks, like domain control. If you build a control deck and you run cards, let's call it an Esper control deck. And then you run cards in it like um, Xander's Lounge, right? Which can tap for a red, but can also tap for a black and a blue. You can get those extra domain types into your deck because the Streets of New Capenna lands have the land types on them. So if you happen to have a Xander's Lounge and a Rafine's Tower or all the other types somehow, you're paying four mana for a minus four minus five, or minus five minus five, because it's one plus. You're paying four mana for minus five, minus five till end of turn. That should kill most of the board and that's a really good rate for it. So even if you don't happen to have that Christmas land thing going on, it, it if you have three types, if you're a three color deck, minus four, minus four is languish territory, which was an all-star in its time. So I think this card is going to see play. I think that three color control is going to be more common than two color control because of the streets of New Capenna lands and because the pain lands uh, really do open a lot of doors. I think that they're going to want to adjust their mana base to play kind of domain control because I think that domain does have enough powerful effects in the format, including this one. Therefore, I think this is a very playable card. It is kind of sad that if you craft this, you can't play it in your mono black decks and you probably don't want to play it in blue black control very often. It's for a very specific type of player. And if you plan to play domain control, which I do, this one is up there as a potential four of because the other sweepers in the format that it's competing with are so-so. Meook Masker is very good, but super mana intensive, and you really do want to pair it with an effect like this that you can play on four that gets above rate instead of Meook Massacre, which is always kind of shooting below rate, like you're paying five mana for minus three, minus three, for example. Um, the next best sweeper is probably Farewell, which is all the way up there at six mana. So Drag to the Bottom sits in a great spot, and I'm going to... I, I think if you're into domain control, if you are down for playing three color control plus, uh, drag to the bottom is probably a four of. I think it's the best thing that you have right now. Evolved Sleeper is one black for a one one creature human rare, one black, it becomes a human cleric with base power toughness two two, one and a black, with a death touch counter on it, becomes a Phyrexian. Actually, we covered this one. This was one of the first cards revealed. We, we covered this one what feels like a month ago. One black black, put a plus one plus one counter on it. You draw a card and you lose one life. It's open-ended, that last ability. So no matter what happens, you have a mana sink now. You can keep putting counters on it, paying life, drawing cards. I... I like cards like this in general because it gives you a lot of options on all of your turns. However, I think that best of one standard, I think best of one standard is defined by how powerful and how efficiently you can curve out. And I think that pumping mana into a card like Evolve Sleeper is asking for a bit of a blowout, right? Uh, as soon as you put some mana into it, the opponent responds with like a play with fire or something like that, or they untap in Brutal Cathar and set it back to nothing, right? Just thinking about this against Brutal Cathar takes a lot of the steam out of the card. I like that cards like this exist because I enjoy them, but I think they were made for a slower standard format and best of three specifically where leveraging your turns and taking your time is important. In best of one, in the modern era on arena, it's much more important to curve out with strong threats, more strong threats than putting more eggs into a basket. I like the idea of playing a few of these in like mono black control and then late in the game when you have a ton of mana slamming this and then you try to take over the game, but maybe I'd rather use something like a Toxril if I'm gonna do that. Uh, just something big and powerful instead. I think that there is a mono black deck that's going to be good and an aggressive one at that, but I don't know that it involves Evolve Sleeper. I can build a good curve without it. So I'm going to give Evolve Sleeper a zero craft, which is too bad because I like the concept of the card quite a bit. 
Next up is Maestra Sabia de la Academia. Dude, librarians, what's up? Um, anyway, this is the executive librarian, temporary name. The real names are spoiled, by the way, on the day that I'm recording this. They just haven't updated on Scryfall yet. So if you know the real name for this card, put it in the comments. Engagement Farm. Anyway, at the beginning of each player's draw step, that player may draw an additional card. If they do, spells they cast this turn cost two more to cast, and it's a 2-3. What a weird card. Here's the thing about it that's interesting. It says spells they cast this turn cost two more to cast. If you're playing a draw go deck, say that you're playing some blue-ish control. Let's call it blue white or blue black control just for theory's sake. And the opponent is playing an aggro deck. If you play this and the opponent on their turn takes the additional card then they're probably not going to cast anything on their turn everything's more expensive on your turn you take the additional card you cast nothing but you just say go and all, you're running a ton of instants so now you can play your spells on their turn and on your turn draw two cards i like that that sounds really fun that said, the card is super fragile. The card isn't the easiest to cast. The card is only for a very specific deck. That deck may not actually be very good as giving the opponent opportunities to draw more cards. And then there is the chance that they just draw extra cards. And if they have like a one mana card, like a strangle and they just kill this, they're up a card on you from your card. That's really bad. Um, so I'm going to give this a do not craft because I think that the downside is too real, but I'm going to try to do things with this. And if what I just said excited you, you should, you'll probably try it as well. Let's be real. Magic is a bit of a thirst trap sometimes. Drawing cards is one of those thirsts. It gets us every time. Golden Argozi. Four, three, four mana for a three, six legendary vehicle, rare. Whenever it attacks, exile each creature that crewed it this turn. Return them to the battlefield tapped under owner's control at the beginning of the next end step, and it's crew one. Now, remember, you can tap any number of creatures, so the crew one isn't actually a restriction. It's just anything can do it. So, hmm... That's pretty exciting because on one hand, maybe you just have a spirited companion and you want to exile it and draw an extra card. On the other hand, maybe you played multiple creatures that have cool ETBs. You exile all of them, bring them back. Is this the new Yorian? Uh, let me try it out. Orgosi! Maybe. Um, I, it's an interesting card for sure. For one thing, it has to attack to get this effect. So you can't play it on turn four, crew it with creatures that are already on the battlefield and get the effect unless it somehow had haste. Very unlikely. Um, so you play this for four. I guess you do have a three, six blocker, that booty thick and vehicles are pretty hard to attack through. And then on the next turn, you can attack with it and get the mass blink of all the value if you want to. That seems really slow and extremely clunky compared to, say, just casting something like a Semester's End or a Teleportation Circle. Yeah, I'm not convinced by this card. I think a vehicle that does a similar job is Mysterious Limousine that sees very fringe play. I'm probably going to try something with this card, but this seems like a bait to me. My crafting recommendation is zero. Guardian of New Banalia, one and a white, two, two, creature, human, soldier. I did read this on a previous show. One thing that you guys brought to mention in the comments is that enlist only increases power, not toughness, which was something that I didn't see right away, but it makes this card even better compared to other enlist cards because of the ability to gain indestructible by discarding a card. So that is a serious, like, advantage that this card has over other cards because other cards might just trade when they attack because it's only a power bonus 
All right, having seen most of the set now, I haven't seen a better two drop. So I do feel that this is going to get serious play in a number of white aggressive decks and that they're going to test it out. Will it live up to the hype? Um, there are multiple sweepers, including Meat Hook Massacre, that kill this very easily. So to me, it doesn't pass the Meat Hook test. It doesn't strike me as a great card. It's very average. And it it's the kind of card that, in my opinion, can get outclassed very quickly as the format moves forward, as new sets come out. If you really want to play mono white or white aggressive strategies and you are looking to replace Luminarch Aspirant, this is not nearly as good, but it's probably better than other options that we have unless you're running Thalia. And a lot of decks don't necessarily want to run Thalia because they like spells. So craft this if I just described you. Everybody else don't craft it because I do. I am not convinced it's going to be a great card for the duration of the format. It's a, it's a good card, but I think that there's still enough and too many, quite frankly, ways to kill it uh, that punish you pretty hard. Wandering Emperor, like this attacking, especially if it enlists something and attacks into a Wandering Emperor, is very feels bad to me. So I don't think this card is even in the ballpark of replacing Luminarch Gas Pirate. I think it's very average. And you might even be better in at several points in the meta with like a Sun Gold Sentinel. Next up is Haughty Jin. This is one and a blue blue for a star four flying Jin. Its power is equal to the number of instants or sorceries in your graveyard. A little uh, Drake throwback. If anybody remembers the Drake's deck, there's like the crackling Drake and there's the three mana Drake from the last Dominaria. The instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. That's exciting. Getting a little reduction on your spells is fun, unless you're casting Memory Deluge, in which case you see less cards, but it's still fine. Um, is this card good? What is the deck? I mean, if somebody's going to run a deck loaded with instants and sorcery spells, it's probably going to be me. I like that it makes marches cheaper. Uh, March of Otherworldly Light, March of Wretched Sorrow. Like, that's pretty cool, getting an extra pip on your march. Um, other than that, like, I'll probably try this card out, but is it the finisher you're looking for? It dies to Doomblade. It's killed by everything short of lightning strikes and strangles. Opponents will remove it very easily, and it doesn't have direct ETB value. Um, also, a bit of a Tempest Jin throwback, if you guys remember that one. I'm not sold that we need this card, so I'm going to give it a zero for now because I don't think it does everything you're looking for, but I wouldn't be surprised to see decks built around this. I'll probably build decks around this. We'll see how good those decks actually turn out to be, but don't craft yet. Wait and see. Herd Migration, six and a green for a domain. Create a three, three green beast creature token for each basic land type among lands you control. And for one in a green, discard it, search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put into your hand, then shuffle, gain three life. I think people are going to get excited about that discard it kind of channel-ish ability. And it's really not that great. It's um, a revitalize that always draws land. And I admit that sometimes my decks sort of wanted, would, would have settled for that. Like I've played control decks that would settle for that. It is kind of a bummer. That's just a basic land though. And casting it, doesn't seem great like if you cast this what are you gonna like if you get five three threes for seven mana are you really doing it probably not i mean it's just begging to get meat hooked isn't it so this card is it might see some fringe play for the channel ish ability like maybe there's a deck that wants instants and sorceries in the graveyard really bad like we just talked about a card that does something like that but this is a don't craft in my opinion by the way, if you've gotten this far, you probably already figured it out. Most cards are not crafts. I take your wild card seriously, and I know you do too. So I'm only going to try to tell you to craft the very elite best of the best cards that are going to be played across a number of decks or make absolutely make or break a deck. I'm not going to tell you to craft cards that might be good. Um, I'm trying to lay out criteria where you might want to craft them anyway as I go. But just because I say that most cards are not do not crafts, that doesn't mean the set is trash. Every set is like this every set in magic like is kind of that loot boxy type thing where you open a pack will you get a good rare or will you get a rare and i think that the closest thing we ever got to 
magic where everything was busted and everything was a must craft was throne of eldraine and people didn't enjoy that format very much it absolutely it, it, some would say to this day that it killed standard standard has never been as popular since eldraine as it was before it and it may never be again so uh it is normal for most of the cards to be do not crafts i probably should say that earlier in the video because a lot of people probably already left me comments being like this is garbage he doesn't like anything and they went to somebody who's going to hype them over every single card uh but i'm gonna be real with you this is the arena it's cutthroat it's bloody out there and we know it's expensive so we only want to craft the absolute bangers all right Ivy, Gleeful Spell Thief, is green and blue for a 2-1 Flying Fairy Rogue. It's legendary, it's rare. Whenever a player casts a spell that targets only a single creature other than Ivy Spell Thief, you may copy that spell. The copy targets Ivy. What are we doing with this? It's super cheap. It has evasion. It's not... Like, like, if this were three mana for this ability, I'd probably hate it. Two mana is, like, right there where this is playable. So, now I'm looking at it like, do we play this in the Bant deck with Illuminator Virtuoso? Or with the, um, it's not Luminar Aspirant. That card is rotating. The, the, the Mage, the O1 uh, Luminary Visionary? I, it's something. Anyway, you know the one I mean. The Magecraft cards. The little protect these and attack with them and give them trample and win the game. This card seems really good in that deck. Um, like, really good. Kind of terrifying if you, like, Snakeskin Veil or something like that, one of them, you give extra plus one, plus one counter on both. Uh, same thing with the phasing card, slip out the back. And then if there are cards that just give it, like, a good temporary bonus, like a giant growth type effect, you know, you hit extra hard. <sighs> this card might see play in that deck. I don't love that deck. I don't play that deck often. If you do, you probably want to try a few of these. And I, if you do, I would start by crafting two and see how it goes. Because, hey, you can always build a historic brawl deck. That's probably really exciting with it. Um, yeah, that's where I would go first if you're already into Illum Illuminator Virtuoso type shenanigans. Next up is Gyra, the f Gyra? Gyra, the Fiery Negotiator two red red for four loyalty we did read this on a previous show a few months ago my opinion of it hasn't changed i think it's a decent mid-rangey planeswalker that will probably see play out of sideboards or in a couple like red mid-range decks in best of three in best of one i think that its best home is a home that's going to curve out with creatures it sounds stupid to say, but think of it like the new Embercleave. If you have almost all creatures in your deck and you're gonna go one drop creature, two drop creature, three drop creature, four drop, you slam Jaya, you minus two, you kill an opponent's threat when you swing with your stuff, and then they can't defend against all the damage coming across, and you have a Planeswalker on the board now that's going to continue that kind of pressure, it can just do it again next turn if they only play a blocker. Like, that's really good. That's Jaya's home. So there will be some aggressive red base deck, it might even be Boros, where you will want to try one or two Jaya. I wouldn't go above that. Jaya doesn't necessarily win the game on its own the way that an Embercleave did. Um, so my crafting guidance for this would be one if you plan to play Boros, two if you plan to play Mono Red. That's where I see this really fitting in. The next card is Joyra, Ageless Innovator. Blue and a red for a 2-3 Legendary Creature Human Artificer. And you tap it. Actually, we read this on a previous show, too. You tap it for two Ingenuity Counters, and then it lets you cheat in artifacts with mana value X or less from hand to battlefield, where X is the Ingenuity. This is this card is really cool. Um, I want it to be good. I don't know if we have all the artifacts we need in the set, but there are some coming up that are very particularly strong that Joyra combos very well with. On its own, you can sneak out Reckoner Bankbusters and activate them the same turn to draw cards. You can get Celestis onto the battlefield for free, which is sometimes a little bit clunky to find a window to resolve these things while also fighting off the opponent. And a 2-3 body for two can block some things. It's not exactly easy for the opponent to navigate. I've noticed that playing Denik. Uh, Denik's been serving me very well. So I don't know if we have all the artifacts we need, but we have some good ones. 
And if you are a tinkerer and a brewer, I think Joyra is very much for you. I know I'm going to be playing it in Historic Brawl. I've already got a commander deck ready to go around it that I'll be playing on a commander channel in the near future. So I'm high on the card, probably higher than most. I think that if you don't plan to play like an artifact tinkering deck, you just want to avoid this entirely. However, with Brothers War coming up being an artifact set, and with a few cool artifacts already ready to sneak into play, if this is a card that excites you, it's one of those that I don't think is a like a two of or a three of. If you want this, you want it, and you want it in your opening hand, you want to get it going as soon as humanly possible. I would say for 90% of the player base, Joyra is a zero, and I would say for 10% right now, it is a four. And that's because I think Joyra will age well and might instantly be a four and a meta player when the Brothers War comes out, when there is an artifact theme set, when, you know, cheating out four mana artifacts for basically free is super powerful. So Joyra, uh, get used to it. Don't forget it's in the format because I think it's going to show up at some point. I love the way, I specifically love the way that you play this on two. And then on the next turn, you can like basically cast an artifact and the turn after that cast another artifact while leaving up mana, leaving up mana for interaction, for counter spells. Of course, the blue mage in me loves that. I want to play some kind of a counter spell and interactive based blue red artifact deck. Doesn't that sound fun? <clears throat> next up is Joda the Unifier and they hooked us up with the stained glass art on this one. So this one is a Wooburg. Nice. Mythic 5-5. Five, five. Okay, stats. Legendary creature. And it says legendary creatures you control get plus X plus X, where X is the number of legendary creatures you control. Whenever you cast a legendary spell from your hand, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a legendary non-land card with lesser mana value. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. <laughs> Put the rest on the bottom in a random order. It's a combination of Anthem and Cascade for your future spells in one card. And it's actually reasonably costed if you can get Wooburg. Is the mana base of standard going to be good enough for Wooburg? I think so. This is also a human, which means you can use cards like Secluded Courtyard to cheat on the mana requirements a little. And there's a number of lands in this set that actually really help with this situation a lot. Um, more than just the pain lands. The pain lands are great, and the new Capenna lands are very good. But there's even more in this set to help out with this. So I feel like this is going to be a deck. Um, part of the problem with Joda is it's reliant on the rest of the legendary creatures to be very good on their own so that when you don't draw Joda they compete and then you look at curves and you see cards like Thalia and you're like okay you know if we've got a lot of Thalia type cards in our our format we got some like there's Adeline in the format there's all kinds of really strong legendary cards that just come down hit hard develop board presence so there's going to be some Legends Matter where some deck that is like Legendary Matters and Joda is the key part of it because this effect is huge. Like if you have two other Legendary creatures playing something that gives them plus three plus three because it does count itself is so strong, like insane. Um, yeah, and it also says whenever you cast a legendary spell, so like you play a Celestis and you get a Cascade. A Celestis looking like a card that could really help this deck as well as a little bit of glue. Um, Planeswalkers are legendary, so you could do kind of a super frenzy thing as well. Card is good. Card is mythic. Card is very narrow. Card only fits certain kinds of types of decks. So I don't know how to grade this one because part of me says that there's going to be a bard class. Oh wait, that's rotating, thank God. <laughs> anyway, in historic this and bard class, whoa. Um, but that there's gonna be, there's gonna be some kind of legendary matter deck and it might be good, but I think you can wait and see how good it is before you craft it. And if you're a brewer with mythic wild cards to burn, I think that might be one of the first things you try to craft from this set to test its power level is a Joda legendaries matter deck because this is one of the best anthems we've ever seen 
in a deck that's going to be very difficult to build like and super expensive like this is budget gamers close your eyes pretend this card doesn't exist because it's probably going to cause you some fomo if that deck is good um i this is going to be i think it's a four of in that deck too i think every time you have it it's great you can always just cast it and cascade and then just legend rule itself if you need to so four of for the legendary brewers Everybody else, stay away, especially the budget gamers, because this is going to be an expensive deck. Wait and see. Karn Living Legacy is four colorless, four loyalty. I did read it on a previous show, so we'll skip over the full reading. Basically, it's really good if you can generate artifacts. And I asked you guys to let me know what you would do with Karn. And there was a lot of like, well, Anvil needs artifacts. There are a lot of like decks that like artifacts. There's um, various artifact requiring like stuff from Kamigawa, like Tezzeret, uh, Betrayer of Flesh likes artifacts. Um, but yeah, I, I found Karn. I wanted to run Karn with Joyra. So that's one of the first things I'm looking at, um, looking for ways to just kind of pay the mana because this helps you get artifacts on the field and then the artifacts have activated abilities like Reckoner Bankbuster that Karn can do. So it's kind of a big mana type approach, but even that is not, I would say, strictly strong synergy. And I'm still looking for a home for Karn that convinces me it's a powerful card and I haven't found it. So for now, I'm giving Karn Living Legacy zero craft. Wait, wait for somebody else to break it. I don't see it. Next up is Karn Silex, which is three colorless for a legendary artifact at Mythic. When it enters the battlefield tapped, players can't pay life to cast spells or to activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. Cool line of text uh, that shuts down kind of the Phyrexian, paying Phyrexian mana. Uh, in the set. The next ability is X tap, exile the Silex to destroy each non-land permanent with mana value X or less, activate only as a sorcery. So this is one of the cards that I was looking at could be really good with Joyra because the enters the battlefield tapped of this gives the opponent a turn to basically hold back and not play into the Silex if they can't deal with it or a turn to deal with it and keep their board state, which is really bad. But with Joyra, you can cheat it onto the battlefield, untap and then blow up the board, which you know what? It would be sad to lose Joyra. Maybe we phase it out. Maybe we phase her out with March of Swirling Mist, but sometimes you got to blow up the board and this hitting Every permanent, every non-land permanent is a super versatile and it's colorless. So you get kind of an Ugin type of effect. So the Silex is very cool. Um, kind of card I really enjoy. I'm going to look forward to finding homes for it. I can see dropping this in mono black, uh, like a control like mono black deck where you just put this out early. So the opponent has to pace their threats. And now you get to just kind of deploy this that where you want to or remove what you want to or attack their hand like a discard deck. If you play Karn Silex, then they really want to play out their stuff because, you know, they don't. I'm sorry. Opposite. Opposite day. They don't want to play out their stuff because it would get blown up. But then you just start hitting them with discard effects or you play, say, the Raven Man, which it can tap to make them discard a card or Liana of the Veil. And it's like, oh, crap, I've got to play my stuff. And then they play their stuff. They get it blown up. I like that kind of game. It seems like it's been a long time since that kind of game was good. So I'm not super stoked, convinced that this is going to be the best thing to be doing. But I am going, here's the thing. It's colorless. It can fit in all kinds of decks. So unless you're strictly an aggro gamer, like if you are a mid-range combo or control player, crafting two or three of these for the next two years, you can play in all kinds of decks. So I'm going to be crafting three and I'm going to be pretty happy about it. The next card is Carpoos in Forest. Just craft four. The pain lands are great. Um, whether No matter what three color, two color deck you're playing, the Carpoos in Forest is another classic. Gruel loves it. Keldon Flame Sage is two and a red for a two, three with enlist. When it attacks, look at the top X of your library where X is its power. You may exile an instant or sorcery, mana value X or less from among them. Put the rest on the bottom in a random order. You may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. Man, this card is right on the edge. It is three mana, no haste, no ETB. That is usually a death sentence to a card in standard. On the other hand, 
When you attack with it, and if you enlist any creature that you might have played before it, like a two or a one drop, and it adds some power to this, you get to cast a free spell. On the other, other hand, this is a difficult deck to build. It needs enough instants and sorceries that you're going to hit them in the top X of your library decent enough. You probably want some creatures to enlist, maybe some vampires and stuff, but then you're a human shaman, so the tribal stuff it might not be there. I can't picture this making it into the current rotating version of the deck, of the Boros deck. I just don't see it, so I don't think it's home there. So I don't see a home for the deck. Um, I don't see it. I, I don't see where this card fits. So I'm giving this a zero on the craft. It's a cool card, but it's a tough ask to build the deck for it. And it's right on the, it's like that three mana spot without haste is usually unplayable. Next up is the King, King Darien, XLV3. I, I don't even, what? Anyway, one green, white, two, three, human, soldier, rare, other creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Other creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Nice. Three and a green, white, put a plus one, plus one counter on King Darien and create a one, one, white soldier creature token. Okay. Pretty good mana sink. Sacrifice King Darien ca creature tokens you control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. That doesn't save you from a Meat Hook Massacre. And it doesn't save you from that new Mutilate-esque domain card. It doesn't save you from a lot of things. Uh, also, you're sacrificing the king. Like, what do you want to sacrifice tokens to defend the king? Because the king is what's making the tokens better and getting the counters. I guess there's a flavor win here. I'm sure that the king sacrifices himself for his people. Very noble. Well done, king. But... As far as like the strength of card, wouldn't you want to defend the king? I think you would. Um, so I'm super cynical of the card. It is a lot of text on a three mana two three that provides an anthem and it's legendary. And there's that legendary sub theme we've talked about. So this card is another one that feels like it's on the edge of playable to me, but I'm going to advise you not to craft King Darien. Um, I think there's, the cost is just, a, you know, it's that spot. It's that really tough to get that tough three drop spot. And I don't think this quite offers enough. Leaf Crown Visionary is green green for a one one elf druid that gives other elves you control plus one plus one. And whenever you cast an elf spell, you may pay green if you do draw a card. Whew. This is one of a cycle of traditional lords that is like two mana for a creature that gives a plus one plus one bonus to a tribe that it is in. Uh, there are several of these in the set and they are good. This one might be the best. Getting Having an effect where you can pay a green to draw a card is really good, especially in green, a color that's very good at creating extra mana and in the tribe of elves, which are very good at creating extra mana. I don't know if Standard has enough quality elves for this to jump straight up the playability scale and become like a serious competitive deck, but given the fact that we're early in the format, it's a five set format and we're going to get more sets added and we're going to be on Dominaria for a while, I imagine many more elves are coming. There might be enough elves to make a competitive-esque deck now and they're probably, I, I, in fact, I'll say there definitely will by the time that this card would rotate. So this is a very safe craft and if you love elves, this is a four of. I think it's that good as a Lord. Having a card draw type effect on it lets you kind of recoup some of that disadvantage if you get Meat Hook Massacred. You can, when you play your next couple of elves, draw some cards and you should be gassed up even if something happens to your board. So yeah, Leaf Crown Visionary is a four of if you are an elf fan. Leyline Binding is five and a white for an enchantment rare with flash. It has the domain thing, it costs less, for each basic land type, and when it enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Leyline Binding leaves the battlefield. The art is pretty cool. That like the kind of getting rainbow hugged. Um, 
I'm going to continue to talk about like domain control because it's a deck that I have in my head is something I'm definitely going to build. And if I have a Spara's headquarters and a Rafine's tower, you know, I'm playing white blue primarily, but I have these lands that create extra types, then Leyline Binding can potentially only cost two mana, have flash and exile things. And that's really good. How many would you craft at rare if you're going to run this type of deck, like I'm not thinking of it as a four of, you don't want it too early because it's not very good. You really want it late on a double spell type turn, counter one thing, remove thing that's been bugging you. For me, this is a two of, I think crafting two is right for that style of deck. The next card is Liliana of the Veil, a reprint and one that I talked about in a previous video. Having seen more of the set, I'm still excited about this card. It does have sweet synergy both from making players discard and from making players sacrifice creatures with a few other cards in the set. And it kind of fits, I think it still stands above the typical tempo of the set. I think it's pretty good that you can have a Planeswalker this cheap that can defend itself in a format that's going to play out probably some creatures and some value. Some, you think of Wedding Announcements and Fable of the Mirror Breaker type effects for three mana, and then uh, cheap, just kind of almost Grizzly Bear-esque creatures at two. There's a huge drop off in card quality right now between the two and the three. You think about the two drops and it's like Tenacious Underdog. It doesn't spiral. and. It doesn't take over the game the way that two drops may have in the past, like Luminar Gas Pirate. Uh, Robber of the Rich also comes to mind as a two drop that could just dominate a game if not answered. Runaway Steamkin had to basically die right away. Um, we're, we don't have those. I can't think of many cards that are doing anything along those lines. So having a Liliana of the Veil is going to be a part of that power jump from two mana to three mana where the game really heats up at three. And I think Lily's right there. She's competing in that spot. And I think that if you're going to play a good amount of black decks and you are as much a fan of magic and the lore and Liliana as I am, this card coming to arena is a big deal. It's also probably going to be very playable in Explorer and shake that format up a bit too. So get your crafting out. It's a mythic, it's expensive, but I would craft four. I think Liliana the Veil was good, is still good and is going to be an important part of standard. Lanawar Graft Widow is two and a green for a rare four three spider with reach and trample. This is a domain card. Seven green activated ability. Return this from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. It gains if this permanent would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. So only one, you only get it back once, I guess, unless you can bounce it, no? if it would leave the battlefield. Okay, you can't even bounce it. Can't flicker it, nope. Uh, so yeah, it's a one time you get this back. This ability costs one less to activate for each basic land type among lands you control. Okay, let's say it's, we have three land types. Um, so you're talking about five mana to get back your four, three reach trample, trample tapped. I'm not excited about it. I, I'm gonna be honest, like I'm not convinced that's great it's just very okay and i if it didn't have that domain text if it were just three mana for four three reach trample i probably wouldn't play it at all the fact that you can discard it to something like a liliana the veil or fable the mirror breaker and then cast it from the battlefield later is fine but it feels like there are cards that might better serve that purpose like denik like Tenacious Underdog, maybe not in green though. So maybe this card finds a niche, but this is a zero for me. I'm, I'm saying don't craft this for now because I think you can do better things with your mana at every step of the curve. Lanoir Loam Speaker is one in a green for a one three. We read this earlier on the show. It's a mana dork. It also makes a, a land into a three three that can swing. I haven't seen a ton of support for this in the rest of the set. You know, there aren't a lot of other cards that are like land creatures get this or land creatures have that or whenever a land becomes a land creature, create another land that is another land creature of the same type. You know, there there isn't any of that synergy. It's just a solid mana dork elf. And now that there are tribal like power for elves, like elves do have some support. This is probably a four of if you're going to craft the Elf Lord, because this is going to be one of the better elves in the format. And you'll probably find other homes for it across the 
across the planes. I guess we're not leaving the plane, but across the next several sets that are set on Dominaria, you'll probably find plenty of homes, especially since it makes mana of any color. It might fit in the five color deck, but um, yeah, you know if you need elves for your elf deck. And if you do, this is one of the best mana dorks. So craft four. Myria, Scholar of Antiquity, is one and a red-green 3-3 legendary creature elf artificer at rare. Gruel elves, huh? Tap an untapped non-token artifact you control for green. Tap an untapped... Where do you get an untapped non-token artifact? <laughs> there aren't they all... <laughs> no treasures. Okay, got it. Anyway, tap two untapped non-token artifacts you control to exile the top card of your library. You may play it this turn. It definitely gives your artifacts an outlet. Like, what artifacts are we playing in Gruul? Equipments? Vehicles? I'm, I'm super skeptical. Like, if it didn't say non-token artifact, this card would be sweet with cards like Gala Greeters and Treasure Craters. But obviously that's not the case. So if you find yourself in a position where you're putting a lot of artifacts on the battlefield that aren't tokens, this card is close to good because you can use it the turn you cast it and kind of get it to pay for itself, at least some of its mana cost for free, get that impulsive card draw every turn to dig through your deck. But I don't think that the cards exist to support this yet, so it's a zero for now. Nemata, Primeval Warden. This one was covered in a previous video. A new Kalitas type tree folky sapperling thing without lifelink, but can also be a card advantage engine. I still don't see the curve for it, but we need legendary creatures to fill out our Jota deck. And this one is close, like it's potentially good. And that deck is five color. So I could see a one of going in that deck because this card is totally fine. So. Craft one, I suppose. You can also try it in other mid-rangey green-black decks and see if the ability comes up and is useful enough because I don't think it's very far from playable without tribal synergy. So I think crafting one of these is fine. The next land is Plaza of Heroes. This is a rare land. It taps for colorless. It also taps to add one man of any color and spend this mana only to cast a legendary spell. It also taps for one mana of any color among legendary permanents you control. And for three and a tap, you exile it and target legendary creature gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Commander staple. Like this card, like from a financial perspective, is probably going to be valuable if it's not reprinted into the ground, which it might be, because it seems like an awesome land for commander. And trust me, commander mana bases are expensive, but this isn't the commander review. What do, we, what do we think about this for Arena? Is this craftable on Arena? Is this playable in standard on Arena? Yes. Um, yes, I think so. There's definitely going to be the Legendary deck. That deck would probably run four of these because once you cast your first Legendary spell, you start getting online to use this for multiple colors. And if you have a ton of Legendary cards in your deck, you're it's going to cast all of those. I think that the third of the last ability of using this as a protection effect isn't going to be used nearly as often but i think that's okay i don't think you want to stone rain yourself all the time to save a legendary creature it's kind of a last resort but if you're going to play the legendary deck then yeah this is a four of for that specific deck i told you that deck would be expensive so yep um it if you don't want to play this in domain it doesn't have a type. It's not gonna help you there. So it's a very narrow, very specific, specific card. So craft with care, know what you're getting into, but it is a four of for that specific deck, which feels like it could be very powerful and playable in best of one. Aquarian Beast Caller is one in a green for a rare 2-2 Dryad Warrior. Whenever you cast a creature spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on the Beast Caller. When the Beast Counter dies, distribute X plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures you control where X is the number of counters on the Beast Caller. That's good. Um, wow. I mean, it is a bear and there is a bear on there. It's a two, two for two. But then every creature you cast afterwards makes it bigger. And when it dies, it like, it, those counters don't necessarily go away. You kind of get some lasting effect on your other creatures. 
People have been asking me about mono green post rotation. What mono green loses that's most impactful is Blizzard Brawl. And it, to a lesser extent, an inscription of abundance. It doesn't have good removal anymore. Did this set change that? I haven't seen a card that makes me think so. But now that I see some good threats, this could also see play in green, white, in Gruul, in Slesnia, you know, some creature based strategies there. Like, this is a really good threat. Um, really good. It's a shame it's not an elf. It is a warrior, though, which those types have been pushed as well. Yeah, this is going to show up in decks. Um, and whether or not you should craft it depends on how into like green beat down you are. So if you're the type who's going to be missing mono green and want some of that flavor again, this card is probably right up your alley. Exactly what you want to play with your Ulvenwald oddities and your ascendant pack leaders. So yeah, it's a four of for that for that audience, which is good. There's a lot of cards here that are super powerful for specific deck types. They aren't generally powerful. And it does kind of lead you to choosing a lane and crafting what you need for that lane and then sticking to and mastering that lane. We talked about Rada's Firebrand on a previous video. My opinion on this card has not changed. I still think it's too narrow and doesn't really fit the rest of the format. It doesn't hold up on power level. It definitely doesn't pass a meat hook test. Low toughness that does not grow is going to be a serious downside to your creatures in this format. So I'm still crafting zero Rada's Firebrand. Next is Ragefire Hellkite, four red red for a five three flying rare dragon. When it attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, double strike until end of turn. No haste. Yeah, this thing's, it's a cool dragon, but it's all a bit too slow, isn't it? It doesn't have haste. Ugh, uh, you have to sacrifice for the double strike. It's it's an untap and you might win, but 10 points in the air, like dialed into one kind of unprotected body, isn't even a guarantee of that. This is a zero for me. Rata Drabic of Urborg is two and a white black for a three three zombie wizard rare with vigilance and ward two. Other zombies have vigilance. Vigilant zombies. Don't know how I feel about that. They enter the battlefield tapped, then get, have Vigilance? Weird. Whenever another legendary creature you control dies, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's not legendary, and it's a 2-2 black zombie in addition to its other colors and types. That's cool. Um, this is kind of hard to deal with. The idea that your legendary token creature zombies also have Vigilance means their tap abilities can be used and they can also attack is kind of a neat little thing that might come up rarely but is cool does this get played in the legendary deck like i want to build um a historic brawl deck with sacrifice outlets so that then you can stack legendary abilities and then you sacrifice them to get the tokens right away before something happens to this in standard i don't see it it's kind of okay but there's still too much exile in the format and also this card can just get targeted it has ward but you know if the opponent has to pay for to kill it they do it can be a good tempo gain because they have to kill this before they kill other things but i don't know this card is close and it might even be a sideboard card i'm saying don't craft i'm saying wait and see but i wouldn't be surprised if this card showed up in a number of decks and those of you building historic brawl decks will probably want to craft one for that at least so Maybe it's a craft one, put it in the legendary deck and see how it does. Yeah, I'll give it a one. Rith the Liberated Prime Evil is two and Naya mythic 5-5 five, five legendary creature dragon. And this is a flying ward two. Other dragons you control have ward two. Nice. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature or planeswalker an opponent controlled was dealt excess damage this turn, create a 4-4 four, four red dragon token with flying. Ooh, I need a drink. This card is a killer. <clears throat> the, what's, what's a little frustrating, so many dragons are rotating. Adventures of the Forgotten Realms, so many dragons are going away. Mm, that's kind of sad. You know what I mean? That's pretty sad. And we'll get to protect those dragons. 
There's still a handful flying around, and there are the dragons from Kamigawa, which are pretty sweet and legendary. It sounds really cool to maybe have a legendary dragon from Kamigawa die with this thing out, get the death benefit, and get a 2-2. Two -two. That's another copy of it. And this can help protect it, I guess. Um, that is a very powerful ability. A creature or planeswalker taking excess damage is not... It's not that rare, right? How often do we have to lightning strike a 2-2? Or bolt the bird is a common saying, and that was excess damage. Planeswalkers, how often do we have to ex attack them for exaxes? You can usually deal them extra. And getting that 4-4 four -four out of it, especially with these having ward, very doable. This card might be more playable than it looks. It looks like kind of a Timmy Dragon at first glance, but kind of similar also to the zombie wizard that we just talked about. This is something where if they have to spend their turn spending their two mana removal spell, paying a total of four to kill it, they will. And you're still down mana in that exchange. You might not be down tempo if you were playing other creatures ahead of it, but it still makes the card very medium to me. Hmm. I mean, if you have a dragon's deck, like a Tiamat type historic brawl deck, you're gonna craft one anyway. And you should probably get into historic brawl. So craft one, you know, play it in the five color deck. See how that goes. Uh, the five color legendary deck might really enjoy having a big evasive body that can crank out more creatures. It's a good card. I'm just not sure exactly where it fits with all, so many dragons rotating. Rivas of the Claw is one and a black red for a three three menace Viashino Warlock. Tap it for two mana in any combination of colors and spend it to cast dragons. Ooh, okay. Now we in Rakdos ramping out dragons here. Interesting. Once during each of your turns, you may cast a dragon spell from your graveyard. And whenever you cast a dragon creature spell from your graveyard, it gains when this creature dies, exile it. Okay, that card is cool. Um, definitely a card that gets slotted into a bunch of existing like dragon historic brawl type decks. So you'll probably craft one for that. In standard, is there it, it we we go back to what we just talked about with Rift. Do we have enough dragons? I the Kamigawa dragons are those good enough? Also, it's pretty bad that let's see, it says when you cast it from the graveyard, it gains when it dies, exile it, so you don't get death triggers from your future Kamigawa dragons. That's just a little nombo there. Um every set has a dragon. This is a pretty cool card, but it can also just die to removal. But it's not bad in the late game if you get to cast a dragon from your graveyard when you play it. This card is sweet, and I'm still going to give it a zero on the crafting. Uh, definitely craft one for your Historic Brawl dragon decks, though. Uh, so, I mean, maybe it gets kind of an honorary one for cool factor, but for standard, I'm not convinced. I don't think, don't think it's there yet. Rundvelt Horde Master is one in a red for a 1-1 one, one Goblin Warrior Rare. Other goblins you control get plus one, plus one. When this or another goblin you control die, exile the top card of your library. If it's a goblin, you may cast that card until the end of your next turn. So it's a Lord. It's a Lord with a very cool ability. The ability is a little bit card advantage related where you attack with all your goblins. The opponent blocks some of them because they have to or they're gonna die. And then you exile a few goblin cards and you play them. It is really sad that Battlecry Goblin rotated because right now, other than Squee, I can't think of many goblins that I want to put in a goblin deck at all. Like the goblin coffers seem pretty empty. I'm not convinced that there's a good goblin deck there. You know if you're gonna try to build goblins. The Jim Davis pile driver fans of the world, go ahead and get four of this. I mean, I'm sure Jim Davis is all over this card. It's probably his preview card now that I think about it. But um, I'm not into goblins, and I think the I, I don't think there are a lot of good goblins available, so I'm not going to craft it. And uh, if you're not convinced, you probably shouldn't either. Battlecry Goblin was the best goblin that they had, and it rotated, which is sad. It never, it never really got its moment. Sarah Paragon is two white white for three four flying angel. It's a mythic. During each of your turns, you may play a land from your graveyard or cast a permanent spell with mana value three or less from your graveyard. If you do, it gains when this permanent is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, exile it, and you gain two life. Okay, during each of your turns, you may play a land from your graveyard in white? 
What is going on? Or cast a permanent spell, like a little bit of a Lurus, except it's three mana instead of two. In white? That is a really cool effect. Um, I'm trying to picture, like, lands in the graveyard in white decks in standard. How often does that happen? How, how much does that become a thing? There aren't, like, fetch lands, really. There aren't lands you want to sacrifice often. So I'm going to assume you have to discard them to, like, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, stuff like that. Now, the permanent spell, speaking of Fable of the Mirror Breaker, you can cast a Fable off this. You can cast a Wedding Announcement off this. Those are some really good three mana permanents. Brutal Cathar is another one that comes to mind of just some really powerful permanent spells that you can cast with this thing that keep you ahead on the battlefield. I think this card is really sweet. It is dangerous that if it just dies, um, you probably didn't get much for it unless there was somehow a land in your graveyard and you played this a turn like behind schedule. But the value and the ability of this card to kind of take over the game if you protect it is very strong. I'm really like my control brain is scrambling for like stuff we can bring out of the graveyard with this in a control in a control shell that kind of creates a loop, right? Where okay, they kill the Sarah Paragon, but we get it back, we play it and we get something else back. And I know it exiles things, but you think about like when you would play Leer and then you would bounce Leer, right? With uh, Fading Hope when they tried to kill it. You know, there's got to be some good things that we can do with Sarah Paragon in that type of vein, but with permanence and with powerful permanence. So yeah, I'm looking forward to playing with this card. I don't know what to give you for a crafting recommendation, because I'm honestly not sure how good it is. It's good. I'm not sure how good. Like, this could be a defining card of standard, but it also could just be a thing that you play, it dies, and nothing great happened, and it gets outclassed in the next set or two. It's... Its range is very high. I am going to tell you guys zero, wait and see. I'm going to craft four, <laughs> but I am a mythic freaking whale. I'm going straight in crafting four, and I'm going to try to find the right way to build with this card. And if you already know it, leave it in the comments. Like, how do you build with this card to create kind of loops where it can completely take over a game? Keeping in mind that the permanent that you cast from the graveyard uh, gain, does gain the ability that it is exiled next time it goes uh, back to the graveyard. Just keep that in mind. All right. Sarah Redeemer is three white, white, two, four, flying angel soldier rare. Whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, put two counters on that creature. A pretty cool anthem, but way too expensive. However, power two or less is not the same as casting cost two or less. It doesn't require your deck to be full of cheap stuff. Um, I mean, we can think about like brutal cathars and you know, effects like that that I've already talked about a good amount, but like Wandering Emperor makes two twos. So now it makes four fours if you have this on the field. Still, for me, this is a five drop that doesn't do anything on its own and requires other things. This is a limited bomb and a pretty dead to me card in standard shadow right priest is one in a black for a two two human cleric that gives other clerics plus one plus one we have a clerics lord that's cool three black black sacrifice a cleric search your library for a black creature card put it onto the battlefield and shuffle uh, so immediately my head says demons um demons i mean they even mentioned demonic cults here um the fact that you can go search your library for super expensive demons which are often printed in every set is very cool um any black creature card huh so yeah keep an eye on every black creature card that gets released uh clerics have proven themselves to be a tribe that people get into and they continue to print good ones we've seen a few already in this set review including the very first card that we reviewed the three three that makes things cost more the kind of new elite spellbinder if clerics aren't going away and if demons like giant black creatures are being printed into the set that can take over games i mean this is instant speed too like you can do, this is not as a sorcery. You can do this on end step, flash in that demon to avoid sorcery speed removal and away we go. Like this card looks very good to me. And there will probably be a cleric tribal deck within the next year of standard. And you're gonna want four of these in it. So if, if this sounds like your jam, I think this is a four of. 
Shauna the Purifying Blade is green, white, blue for a 3-3 three, three lifelink. And at the beginning of your end step, you may pay X. If you do, draw X cards. X can't be greater the amount of life you gained this turn. It's a life gain card. I hate life gain cards. Wait, this one lets you draw cards? Never mind. I'm in. Drawing cards can forgive any type of anything for me. If they gave Mono Red a bunch of card draw spells, I'd play it. Anyway. I think this card might be a sneaky good card. I what I love about it the most is it it's it doesn't have haste. It doesn't draw a card when it enters the battlefield most of the time. Uh, there are ways that you can do it if you play it a little off curve. But if you just put this on the battlefield, the opponent is immediately in this spot similar to Fable of the Mirror Breaker where it's like, "Okay, I got to do something about that." If I don't, the opponent's going to gain so much value. Like, they have to kill the goblin token right away, right? Or that, or you're just ramping up and putting pressure. While you're fixing your hand, it's just too risky. This card, when you slam it on turn three, even if you don't draw a card with it, it's like, I better do something. Or next turn, they might just attack and draw three cards. Like, you have to give it attention. That three-card draw could bury them, could absolutely bury them. And it also puts you in the feels bad of, do I play my creature that's the same size or larger to block it? Because if you do that, and then they have some way to make it bigger or remove your creature, it's a total blowout. So this card, I think, passes the test of an absolute must kill for your three mana, three, three. That doesn't have haste. Like it, it is a must kill and it can take over a game. Not only that, any life gain triggers can trigger Shauna. So if you have other ways to gain life without throwing her into combat, that can be a big deal. Um, for me, this card is going to be, it's going to be part of a few decks, I'm sure. Should you craft it? I think it's good enough that if you craft it, you will play it, but I think it's narrow enough that not everybody should craft it because it's banned. Uh, that's not, it's one of the most, it's one of the least played color combinations. So for me, I'm gonna craft four. You should probably wait, unless you're a hundred percent in on like a banned human strategy that really speaks to you. You should probably wait and see if this deck can, this card can make it in a shell that reaches the higher tier. I do think the chances of that are good. I think this card is very, very good. I don't think you'll be sad to open it, and I think you sh should consider crafting it. Next up is Sheldred the Apocalypse, which is two and a black black for a four or five death touch. Whenever you draw a card, you gain two life. Whenever an opponent draws a card, they lose two life. I love this card for commander type formats, Historic Brawl. This card in Lich's Mastery, which is a card legal in Historic Brawl, becomes a like draw your deck combo on its own. This card and cards like Peer into the Abyss and Eldritch Pact can absolutely crush the opponent. I can't wait to play this card in those formats. That said, this is an example of a card that you don't want for standard. Four mana, four, five, death touch. No abilities that impact the board immediately. Possibly the opponent will lose two life. If you say go, they untap, they draw, they lose two life. Then they deal with it. That's like kind of your best case-ish scenario. I will try this card in some decks because the idea of Rafine kind of going off and drawing a bunch of cards and gaining a bunch of life to stabilize sounds good to me. But I wouldn't be surprised if this is not a standard card at all. It might end up being completely unplayable in standard. Do not craft it. Zero. Chivin Devastator. We talked about this card a long time ago. It was one of the first cards spoiled. It was my favorite card among that group of spoiled cards. And I still think it's very good. I think it's a quality mana sink for a number of decks going into the mid game to create some kind of a threat that can just end the game. It's a downhill running card where if the opponent is on the back foot and you need to put them away, this card can really do the job. Better so than a typical fireball because it sticks around. They have to do something about it or they untap and do it again. And sometimes they'll deal with it and you'll untap and just cast another one anyway. It also seems like, like I kind of want to play it with counter spells because it's so flexible. Like you can drop it early or you can play it late and it is leave up whatever interactive mana you want to. But I'm not sure how many you should actually craft, to be honest. I think that there will be a deck out there that takes advantage of this as like a three of, as a design finisher. But I don't know if that deck's going to be that good. Um, I am going to... If you are a red aggressive mage who loves dragons, I would give this a three. 
everybody else, I would give this a zero because there is definitely a world that exists where every spot in the curve gets filled with a high quality threat and you don't need Shivan Devastator or its flexibility. Your deck is already too loaded, but we've seen that there's some dragon synergy. We know that this type of card can be powerful from Mist Cutter Hydra in the past and the type is good. So yeah, um, let's, let's stick with the three recommendation to the dragon aficionados of the world. Shivan Reef, craft four, easy. We're almost there. It says there's the next 60, but I don't think there's 60 more cards, but we'll see. We're in the S's. Anyway, Silver Scrutiny is X blue blue sorcery. When you, you may cast it as though it had flash, if X is three or less, draw X cards. So if you cast it for like five, six, it's like a brain geyser. If you cast it on your opponent's turn, you can just fire it off for one, two, or three. Not bad. Um, I don't know if Standard has room for this effect really right now. It's been a long time since I played a like draw X cards, trying to recreate that Sphinx's revelation magic in Standard. Um, it seems like the format's usually too fast for this type of thing, but uh, Meat Hook Massacre is an interesting card that is kind of like Black Black X, and you make time for that. Obviously, it sweeps the board, so it creates time, and it gains life, so it creates more time. This does not. I, I am approaching Silver Scrutiny with Great Scrutiny. I am going to give it a zero for all of you. I will try it. I will let you know if my opinion changes. Sulkinar the Tainted is two in a Grixis for an elemental demon at Mythic it is a 5 5. At the beginning of your end step, choose one that hasn't been chosen. Demonic Pact! Actually, I read this one a long time ago now. Anyway, you draw a card, each opponent loses two and you gain two. Three damage to a creature or planeswalker, and exile this, return it to the battlefield under an opponent's control. I. The more I have seen come out of the set, the more I see a format that is a little too fast for a 5-mana five 5-5 five five that might get one of these abilities. That said, I'm not ruling it out. I'm going to give it a 0 on the current crafting guide recommendation because I think it's a bit too narrow and it sits in the 5-mana spot, which, like, if it were a 4-mana card, I'd say Legendary deck all day, and then you can drop Joda, and it's amazing, and they will definitely won't live long enough for you to take advantage of getting their hands on Sol Kanar. I am going to build a control deck around this somewhere, but I'm recommending 0. I'll tell you if that control deck is good. Watch the video. Soul of Windgrace is one in a Jund for a 5-4 cat avatar at Mythic. And I read this one a while ago too, but what a card. When it enters a battlefield or attacks, you may put a land card from graveyard on a battlefield tapped. And you can discard land card to gain three life, to draw a card, or to gain indestructible for your 5-4. The more I've thought about this card, the more I think this card is just absolutely bonkers sweet. I think that a good amount of time, you're going to try to set it up by doing like Fable the Mirror Breaker or Cycle of Triland or Celestis discard something. You're going to play this. You're going to get a land. It could be from their graveyard. You can steal lands from their graveyards too. Somebody's going to discard a land. Anyway, Liliana the Veil will do it. So you're going to play this and you're going to ramp a land. The opponent, a good amount of the time, is just going to untap and kill it. But when they don't, or when it's later in the game and you have the mana to give it indestructible, this card can take over the game. It makes your bad draws into just fine redraws and gives you a lot of flexibility. This card, I think, is really powerful, and I'm looking forward to seeing it both in the Jund Grindy decks and the Legendaries Matter deck. And I think if you're going to play either of those, I would craft three Soul of Windgrace. I think coming out, it's a player of a card. It's going to be good. And especially like if you enjoy Commander Historic Brawl, you're going to want one of these anyway. So I'm giving this a three on the crafting guide, which might be kind of aggressive for a card that mostly just ramps you on the land front. But I think the Joda deck is going to love this card. Sphinx of Clear Skies we read on, the, on a previous episode. It's, is it the finisher of choice? Is it our dream trawler? Is it our Imrith Desert Doom? I think it's better than Imrith Desert Doom because it keeps ward even when it attacks, and I think it's worse than Dream Trawler. I'm going to try it. Um, 
But my recommendation on the crafting is zero because I think that this card is another card that looks like it has a bunch of cool stats and ends up seeing no standard play. It just has a trap mythic kind of vibe to me. So for now, I'm giving it a zero on the crafting guide, which is too bad because I think it's a cool card and blue does need a finisher pretty badly. Next up is Squee, the Dubious Monarch, this two and a red, two, two haste. We did read this one before. It was part of the original, like the big reveal stream. Uh, when it attacks, you get a one, one goblin and you may cast it from the graveyard by paying three and a red and X-Langling four other cards from your graveyard rather than paying its mana cost. People ask, why don't they don't, why don't they just call it escape? It basically has escape. It doesn't have escape. Um, escape was when you play it the first time, you have to sacrifice it. And you have to sacrifice it anytime it enters the battlefield without paying its escape cost. So that's a pretty different ability, and they definitely didn't want Squee to have that. They wanted the first casting to actually stick around. So it is, uh, it is definitely a different ability from escape, but very escape inspired. For a deck that plays Squee, getting four cards in your graveyard is going to be hard. So it's not like this card is going to just consistently be coming back over and over. Although we may try a deck that. I don't know, plays a bunch of instant sorceries and draw cards and does fill its graveyard fast and uses Squee as a win con, but I don't think that's a very reliable win con. I think that if you love the goblin tribal archetype and the mono red archetype, you might try this. One of these might also make its way into the aggressive Boros deck. So, I mean, there are people who should definitely craft it for those reasons. I think that the vast majority of people should not craft Squee and should leave, leave Squee on the sideline. But the card is strong enough and has enough flexibility that you won't feel bad opening it. And if you craft one or two copies, you probably won't be sad about it. I guess I'll initially give it a recommendation of one. Sten the Paranoid Partisan is a white and a blue for a 2-2 human wizard. And when it enters the battlefield, choose card type other than creature or land. Spells you cast of the chosen type cost one less to cast. And then for one and a white, you exile it and return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. The cool thing about the blink ability, besides just protecting itself, is you can choose new types as you play the game. So it doesn't become as simple as throw a million artifacts in your deck. That said, I think that's the best way to play the card, is if you can build a deck around a type that is very, very strong, like enchantments, maybe this goes in the Xur deck to reduce the cost of your enchantments, or artifacts in like higher powered formats, this card plus Sensei's Divining Top plus like a Bolus' Citadel just wins you the game or Reality Chip and the Sensei's Divining Top. So you're looking for a combo like that that might come out in standard. I doubt they'll ever reprint a Sensei's Divining Top again, but spell reduction is super powerful and something that you have to watch out for. So for me, this card is very good. The question is the home. like. Am I going to play this in my control deck just to name like instants and sorceries just to cast those things sooner? What if I name Planeswalker and I cast Wandering Emperor for three mana? Is there another sweet Planeswalker I can cast for four mana? There's probably plenty of them. Um, this card has a lot of versatility because you choose the type. It, other than creature or land. And, and that makes sense too. Like it does force you into kind of these weird tribals instead of generic creature different types of creature tribal, human tribal in particular, would be messed up. Yeah, I like this card a lot. I think it's going to have decks that it tries to represent. I think the biggest thing that's going to hold this card back, quite honestly, is that the creatures are so good. <laughs> they, they've printed such good creature cards in standard, but I would love to name like Enchantment and play a bunch of Sagas. I would love to name Planeswalkers. I would love to name all kinds of things. And it does kind of protect itself. So it has the potential to be win con and control decks. I think this card is very good. I'm going to craft two or three. I'm definitely between that. I think two is the safe number. Three is the a bit more aggressive number. And yeah, we're going to try to build some really fun decks around it. The more well you are, the more of these you can craft. It's zero if you're budget, because I, I have a feeling that building around this is going to lead to a lot of brews that don't actually work out. <laughs> but only one of them has to work out to kind of be worth it for ladder. All right, I'm giving it a three. Stronghold Arena, one in a black enchantment rare with kicker green and or white. When it enters the battlefield, gain three life for each time it was kicked. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, you may reveal the top card of your library 
and put it into your hand. If you do, lose, lose life equal to its mana value. That is really cheap. So the kickers are nice. I am not convinced you need them. Like if you just play a one mana creature and then play the arena or you play the arena and then play a three mana creature with haste and you hit the opponent, you're drawing extra cards. After that, as long as your deck is designed to keep hitting the opponent, like, I mean, this seems really good. Um, you're paying a lot of life, so obviously having some access to the kickers later in the game, especially if you draw multiples of these, is very important to rebuild that life total. But we've seen how cards like Meat Hook Massacre already really offset that life loss with cards like Tenacious Underdog. I'm not sure exactly where this fits, if it's like a traditional kind of black aggressive deck, and maybe you run a couple of the pain lands to get the mana you need. That that sounds so counterintuitive, right? Taking a damage to kick this to gain three life. Okay, that sounds terrible. Um, yeah, this is a weird build around card. I'm not even sure, like Abzan, if you actually wanted to play its core colors, doesn't seem like a thing at all. But the card itself seems really good. Uh, you might end up with a low life total, but your opponent will probably get buried by card advantage and damage. It also says May, so you can stop doing it. You don't have to keep doing it until you die. This card is like a three to four of for me because I just picture you play a low curve, especially if you can play like a cheap flyer and keep hitting the opponent. You can get so much value. Picture this in Rogues, where you just have these cheap evasive creatures. There's gotta be something like that that we can build. I mean, this card, Two mana for this effect is super cheap. This card is, I, I think, really good. Let's go with, if you guys wanna wait and see if I can, you know, see if like, this also seems like a Crokey's card. If Crokey's or I like break this card open, you can wait and see if you should craft four. I'm really tempted to give this a four. Um, so I'm gonna, I think that this might be four. I think this is a four of good card. Just any deck that's black aggressive. Like this card is nuts. Sulfur Springs, craft four, easy. Hot tub, the, the old art of this was a devil in a hot tub and obviously they stayed in too long. Temporal Firestorm was one of the first cards spoiled for the set and as kind of a burn down the house vibe, but later in the game, you can save your own stuff. As the format has been kind of fleshed out and we've seen more things revealed, I'm not that enthused honestly, about Temporal Firestorm. I still don't see, I, I I might see it when I play it, but right now I don't see the opportunity for phasing my own things and then wiping the board, although that's a very powerful thing to do. This seems more expensive in the wrong colors and a more difficult setup than a lot of the other board wipes and positional cards in the set. So I'm giving Temporal Firestorm a zero and I'll, I hope I'm wrong. Next is Temporary Lockdown. One white, white enchantment rare. When it enters the battlefield, exile each non-land permanent with mana value two or less until Temporary Lockdown leaves the battlefield. Exile each non-land permanent with mana value two or less until it leaves the battlefield. Tokens, gone. Mana rocks, enchantments, suck them up. Uh, it seems really good against like that enchantment deck where it's got like a million two drops and the one drop is Generous Visitor. This card seems really good for a number of styles of control decks. Basically anything that's not trying to drop a permanent on two, but you could. You could play your Spirited Companion, draw a card, then play this, exile it, and when they eventually get rid of this, you get back a blocker, the companion, and you draw a card. That doesn't seem bad at all to me. So this card is going to be one of the cards I try out in control. It's a really cheap sweeper effect, and boards can get out of hand very quickly as some of the most dangerous things aggro decks do against you is one drop, two drop, one drop, two drop, or one drop, one drop on turn three. This just takes it all out. It's very strong. Crafting guide recommendation on temporary lockdown. Control gamers? Let's go with three. Let's go with three. You're still gonna need other sweepers in your deck to handle the larger creatures, but maybe that's where Farewell is, you know? So let's go with three. The Elder Dragon War is two and a red red for a read ahead saga. Uh, meaning of course that you can skip to whichever chapter you like, but you only get the effects of the chapter you go to. Chapter one, two damage to each creature and each opponent. 
Chapter 2, discard any number of cards and draw that many cards. Chapter 3, create a 4-4 red dragon creature token with flying. This is a lot of value for 4 mana. If you kill anything of your opponents with that Chapter 1, it seems really good. If you kill two or more things, it seems absolutely busted because you take the pressure off yourself. The next turn, you get to fix your hand. If there was any problem with your hand, flooded, screwed, cards that are there in the wrong matchup, you can chuck them and draw new ones. We've seen how good that is from Fable. Chapter three, you deal, you get a 4-4? Four, four? That's really good. And also, it kind of creates this saga curve out in red, which is actually going to be annoyingly value-based and hard to deal with, where they can go chapter, you know, they can go Fable the Mirror Breaker on three, Elder Dragon War on four. It doesn't deal damage. Oh, wait, it does say to each creature. Never mind. <laughs> I thought it was each creature your opponent controls. It's each creature and each opponent, not each creature and each player. Okay. Maybe it doesn't, it's not quite that good because you don't want to play it with a bunch of cheap cards in your deck and blow up your own cards. So a control red saga still probably sees play. Um, I'm not sure how many you need. It is this four of good for best of one. Maybe it is. I mean, at worst, you just skip chapters, right? You can go straight to like fixing your hand. You can go straight to a four, four creature. If you need it is a four, four red for four that good. I mean, it is when you're applying pressure and trying to fly over a battlefield against a, a bunch of white soldiers. But then again, so is chapter one. Yeah, this is a meta-dependent card the more I read it. There are going to be metas where it's great and metas where it's okay, so maybe it's a sideboard card. Let's give it a 2 on the crafting guide, because I think it's a good card, and I'm just not sure in how many spots it's going to come up. Next up is Phasing of Zalfir, which is a card I have read on the show before. The read ahead that lets you phase things, and the chapter 3 that destroys all creatures. I still think that this is more of a commander card than a standard card. And I am actually going to give it a don't craft. But am I sure about that? No, I uh, a part, I really want a blue board wipe that destroys all creatures to be good. But the fact that you give back the two, two creatures and you're still under pressure and you still have to deal with them to me says you should probably be playing a different card. So definitely craft and definitely buy some for commander. But uh, this is a zero for me for standard. The Raven Man. One in a black for a 2-1. Actually, we read this one before. The 2-1 that makes the little birdos every time a player discards a card at the beginning of each end step, if a player discarded a card this turn. So some comments on the Raven Man. You play Liliana, you plus Liliana. At the end of the turn, if you had a Raven Man on the field, how many birds do you make? The answer is one. Um, it says at the beginning of each end step, if a player discarded a card this turn, a player did two players happen to. If you're playing commander, like four players did. It's still only one bird, at least from my understanding of the card. So the more I have seen of the format and the more cards that have been revealed, the more I like this card. It does seem like discarding cards is going to be all over the place and that you can play this in a number of spots. It is legendary, so it might fit into the legendary matters deck. And that is also a drawback because you may not want to craft too many as having too many of the card isn't that good. That said, you could just discard it if you're playing Liliana the Veil and you draw multiples. Maybe that curve of turn two Raven Man, turn three R Liliana is so good that you run four Raven Men to achieve it as often as possible. Maybe. I mean, it's a good amount of pressure, but it's not overwhelming. It's like that cumulative value. That's very interesting. I'm going to give a two on the Raven Man. I'm gonna recommend crafting two copies. I have a feeling this will be playable in a number of decks, but I have a, also have a feeling it has diminishing returns. The World Spell, like the super, super slow story of Tooth and Nail. I still don't see how this card completely comes together in the current format. There's a lot of very powerful cards out there. Um, I mean, the idea of running like one of this in like the Jota deck sounds interesting, but it does kind of stand alone as like a win more type card. So for me, I'm not crafting any copies of the world spell. Zero. Next card is Portable Portal Thran or Thran's Portal because it's in a different language. I, I actually kept on lo looking for Portail Thran because I thought that was a cool name, but 
Uh, the translation is that this is a rare land, and when it enters the battlefield tapped, unless you control two or fewer lands. As Thran Portal enters the battlefield, choose a basic land type. It is the chosen type in addition to other types. Mana abilities of Thran Portal cost an additional one life to activate. It's every pathway, or, or it's kind of like every pathway. It's what the aggro decks needed, and it's kind of amazing that this one land put Boros back on the menu because if it's in your first three lands, it enters the battlefield untapped. You have to pay one life to activate it. So what? You're the aggro deck. They're going to lose their life faster than you lose yours. So while Boros aggro may not have sacred foundry, this is the land that actually fixes its mana. You get your choice. You name mountain or you name plains, whichever one you're needing. And as long as you play this in your first three lands, you curve out great. This land is awesome. It's going to do very well in Commander, but it's also going to fill in every single multicolored aggro deck from now until its rotation. Just go ahead and get four if you're an aggro mage or you just like having some good toilet gaming time and you like curving out. And it might, might, might be control playable too. I say that because you have the pain lands, you have the tri lands, your mana might be good enough that you don't have to play Thran Portal in control, and it might just end up being a tap land that costs you life sometimes and is bad for you. But curving out is so important, and having an early untapped land that lets you have any type that you need lets you keep more hands, which means you mulligan less, and that's so cool. So, craft four. This is one of the best like lands they've made in a long time, because unlike every other cycle of lands where you have to craft four rares of that to play these colors and four rares of that to play these colors and four rares of that, and it just eats up so many wild cards, you can spend your wild cards on this and your two color aggro decks from now until it rotates two years from now, have a land. They have a land that helps you actually curve out well. It's great, it's awesome. Threats Undetected is two green for a sorcery. Search your library for up to four creature cards with different powers and reveal them. An opponent chooses two of those cards. Shuffle the chosen cards into your library, put the rest into your hand. It's a three mana draw two creatures that aren't the two the opponent wanted you to draw. I mean, maybe there's like tribal effects and people want to do this, but usually if you're the creature deck, you don't want to be spending three mana to draw two cards. You want to be spending three mana to continue to add creature presence to the battlefield. And also it hopefully generates value in another way too. For me, this card is a zero. Don't craft, it's a trap. It sounds cool, but when you use it, you're probably doing the opposite of what your deck really needs you to be doing. Timeless Lotus is a legendary five mana artifact at Mythic that enters the battlefield tapped and taps for Wooburg. This card is gonna be awesome with Paradox Engine in all of my Paradox Engine historic brawl decks. And I'm definitely going to craft one for that. For standard. Hmm. You're looking for, like keep an eye out for combos that are like blue and tap and like uh, enchant this permanent, untap this permanent. Things like that, things like Freed from the Real that can create like infinite mana engines somehow. But I am guessing that this card is not going to be standard playable. Taking turn five off to jump to 10 mana, I, I just don't see it. So I'm giving Timeless Lotus a don't craft. And I'm also going to say craft one for your historic brawl decks if you're following along with me in that format. Next card is Tyrannical Pit Lord, which is four black, black, rare demon 6-6. Six, six. Keep in mind, you can cheat it out for five mana by sacrificing a creature to that cleric thing. Flying Trample enters the battlefield. Choose another creature you control. The chosen creature is plus three, plus three, and has flying. When Tyrannical Pit Lord leaves the battlefield, sacrifice the chosen creature. That seems really good. When it enters the battlefield, unlike almost, unlike most demons, that were ever made in magic, it has an effect. Another creature you control gets plus three, plus three in flying. It's probably going to hit high risk, high reward. If the tyrannical pit lord is killed, that creature is going to die too. So 
While I'm excited to try some things around this, and I'm excited to try it in that cleric deck, I'm gonna give this a zero craft. Because I think in a competitive standard environment, if this card, even for a moment, starts to be good, people will start playing the instant speed removal that kill it, and they'll start playing around it, and then it won't be good anymore. So, zero on the crafting guide. Urborg Lurgoif is one in a green for the star and the one star with the kicker of the blue and or the black. And when it enters the battlefield, mill three cards for each time it was kicked. Its power is equal to the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Its toughness is equal to that number plus one. Sweet card, throwback to the original Lurgoif. Big shout out to that Ice Age famous critter. Anyway, is this card good? Should you craft it? I don't see, like you have to play so many creatures and deck, even for this when kicked to really pay off. It is a very cheap threat if you can get a handful of creatures in your graveyard, but we don't have something along the lines of a Stitcher supplier in standard yet. If we get really cheap and really useful enablers to fill the graveyard, we can run this card. But until that happens, I'm not touching it. This gets a zero. Valiant Veteran is one in white for a 2-2 core soldier that gives other soldiers plus one plus one. Soldier, soldiers come and go as a tribe, you know? And they usually span across as a, it's like a subtype. So it spans across multiple other colors and styles. Anyway, three white, white, exile this from your graveyard to put a plus one plus one counter on each soldier you control. So it's an anthem on the board and then a little anthem off the board too. Not bad. The real question is where the soldier's at. Can you build a soldier tribal deck right now that's competitive? I don't, in the just going through it in my mind, I don't see it yet. So I'm going to give Valiant Veteran, unlike a lot of the other popular tribes, I'm going to give this one a don't craft for now. But I bet there is a sol I bet a soldier deck can be built. I'm just not off the top of my head right now, able to see the potential. But go have a look through Arena, search for Soldier, make sure you're searching for things that aren't rotating, and then figure out if Valiant Veteran is what you're looking for. Vesuvian Duplimency. D Duplimence? Duplimency? Three and a blue enchantment, Mythic. Whenever you cast a spell that targets only a single artifact or creature, create a token that's a copy of that artifact or creature, and it's not legendary. Oh, that's another really exciting commander card, but there might be something to be said about it. Uh, the idea that you can play something like this and make copies of those cards that you protect with slip out the back is pretty exciting. But for standard, I think it's too slow, too clunky, but it's right there. It's on the border. Like it's really powerful to be able to keep making more and more virtuosos, you know? But I'm gonna give this a zero. It is a cool card though. Vodalian Hexcatcher is one in a blue for a 1-1 one, one flash that gives other merfolk plus one plus one. And you sacrifice a merfolk to counter target non-creature spell unless its controller pays one. Are there enough merfolk in the set? That is the question because that last line of text is really good. It's open-ended. If you just have a bunch of merfolk tokens or with baby merfolk, you can pitch them to potentially counter spells, making it so hard to board wipe or to get back in the game. And the flash ability, that is a blowout waiting to happen. So the opponent goes to cast their Meat Hook Massacre, you flash this in, you sack some weak little merfolk token, and guess what? Counter your Meat Hook Massacre. Untap, I've still got a board, it's now buffed with plus one plus one, we swing, we damage you. How are you getting out of that? It's gonna be really hard. If there are enough merfolk to make a deck, this is one of the easiest four of lords I've seen in a while. Are there enough merfolk to make a good deck? I don't think there are yet. So if you wait and see on this card, that makes perfect sense. But as I've said a few times in the show, we're on Dominaria for four sets. This is the first of four. That means there will be more merfolk and eventually there will probably be a merfolk deck. So it's all about how early you wanna get on the train. Vodalian Mudslinger, Mindslinger, Mindsinger? Vodal Vodalian Mindsinger is a merfolk that is one blue blue for a 2-2. Two two. When it airs the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it for each time it was kicked. The kickers can be one red or one green. And when it airs the battlefield, gain control of target creature with power less than this creature's power for as long as you control this creature. I really don't like the creatures that when they enter the battlefield, they gain control of something until they die. 
Um, obviously, Agent of Treachery was a bit too much, and it certainly showed the power that a creature with that effect can have. So some would say they have to have this ability. But when I see that, I say, do I really want to play this? Um, it's also power, you know? It's not casting cost where for one blue blue you could play a 2-2 that would gain control of a creature token that could be pretty cool or gain control of another small creature um it is kind of honestly it's probably at its best without the kicker because the more you kick it the more expensive it gets and the more likely it is that you're at a point in the game where the opponent's just going to untap and do something that kills it or removes it when you play it for three and just yoink their two drop and try to continue some aggression and when they kill it all they get back is a two drop or if they sweep the board their two drop dies that's probably this card at its best that said i'm not excited about this card it doesn't really do it for me it's it's trying to do some old threads of disloyalty type stuff but creatures are way too vulnerable for me to enjoy that kind of thing so i'm giving this a zero i wouldn't craft this card weather light completed no not the weather light it's a 5-5 flying vehicle with no crew. There's no way to crew it. <laughs> as long as Weatherlight completed has four or more Phyresis counters on it, it's a Phyrexian creature in addition to other types. Whenever a creature you control dies, put a Phyresis counter on the completed Weatherlight. Then you draw a card if it has seven or more counters on it. If it doesn't, scry one. So you play this for two, and now you have a little bit of value when your creatures die. You get to scry most of the time, and eventually, someday, maybe you draw cards from creatures dying. That's a pretty cool payoff. It's also super cheap, and it does turn into a 5-5 five five once four creatures die, which, you know, sacrifice, aristocrats, something like that could really enjoy this type of card. I'm not going to craft this card, and I'm not going to recommend that you do either, because it seems like a really slow card and a bad reason to take off turn two. But as more sacrifice cards get introduced and maybe they become more powerful, this card becomes better. And I'm really interested in seeing this C play once that there's like a good woe strider in the format, that type of effect. So I'm sure before it rotates in two years that it will have a moment where it's a really cool card to include in a deck. It's still probably only a one of, maybe three of at the absolute most if your deck is really good at killing its own creatures. So keep an eye on it. Also, if you want a reason to read the lore, you can see the dragons, Darigaz and his dragons go toe to toe with a Phyrexian weatherlight. That's some pretty cool lore teaser. Yavamaya Coast, you know the drill. Craft four, then go play your blue green deck. It's awesome. And then Xur, the Eternal Schemer, a card that we did read on the show before and a card I was very excited about. And still, I still am. The text on this card is deceiving because it does give target non-aura enchantment the ability to become a creature and it has base t power and toughness equal to its mana value, but that doesn't go away. It's it's permanent. Um, it is now a creature until it dies. And as long as Xur is around, it also has Death Touch, Lifelink, and Hexproof, which is a lot of stats uh, for whatever creature you, whatever enchantment you turn into a creature. Did I see a ton of enchantments that kind of make me go, oh, that's what I'm playing with Xur? No, but I didn't have to. Just any enchantment uh, that has any kind of decent-ish value becomes very interesting. I also think that there is a lot to be said for this as a finisher in a pillow fort type deck because there are a lot of enchantments. We saw the ley line uh, a while ago um, that has flash and like exiles creatures and opponents control. We saw the enchantment that exiles all creatures uh, or all permanents that are mana value two or less. Like these kind of pillow 40 banishing light type effects, turning them into creatures that have hexproof and then can go beat down the opponent. It sounds like a really cool way to win a game that we haven't seen in a while. So I'm interested to try that. My final crafting guide recommendation for Xur, if you are a brewer and you are a whale, because this is going to be an expensive deck, you, like you're going to need hollowed hauntings and things of that nature and a lot of the sagas. Like if you're going to need to be a whale to be a crafter of Xur. And if you are, just go ahead and craft four because it's probably going to be an important part of your deck that you want to draw every game. You can skimp and go to three if you're going to play a control type deck that doesn't need Xur until your battlefield is established. That's probably the min. 
Uh, if you want to play Historic Brawl, you only need one, and I would recommend it. It looks like a really sweet commander. And to those of you budget gamers, non-whales, this is going to be another one of those FOMO-inducing cards, and you should craft zero and just cover your eyes. All right, guys. We did it. That brings us to the end of the video where we went through and gave a crafting recommendation on every single rare or mythic from Dominaria United. You don't have to take my recommendations. It's absolutely not required that you listen to me. You can do your thing. In fact, if you disagree with me strongly, leave a comment and maybe you can connect with some other people that agree with you and you can talk about what you're going to do with some of these new cards that I'm not as particularly excited about. But uh, also the cards that I really love, like what cards am I way too high about? What cards aren't that good that I'm all over? This set in my opinion is a really good set unlike some of the sets of the past where i thought there were only a few cards that really cut their cut it as super playable this set has a ton of playable cards for all kinds of decks but a lot of them are specialists you know if you're you know if you're a merfolk lover and if you are this is a must craft but to everybody else you probably don't need it and that applies to so many cards in the set but then every now and then you get a thran portal type of card that every aggro mage should craft that completely fixes your mana as long as you're interested in two or more colors and then you get the raven man which fits a wide variety of black decks and some interesting lines of play and it's still not even clear how good it is but you can see that potential temporary lockdown is another card that how much of an impact that can have on the meta is so up in the air that we're not really sure but it's another powerful card for control decks and especially places where you might want to make even more use out of enchantments in some way so it's full of good cards and i actually think that you're going to need a lot of wild cards for it so i hope you saved them up or bought some of those bundles or that you saved a few dollars to get your dominaria united like fund rolling these are the best sets like when a set is both the fall set and has a lot of good cards this is the best time if you're going to spend money on a format and play standard the best time is to spend it now because you get to keep the good cards for two years whereas every set that you buy into after this for the next four sets is legal for less time so if you're about maximizing that value on wild cards now is the time to craft the absolute best cards that you can and hopefully i help you with some of that with this particular set review thank you for watching this video as always i will see you in the next video you're cool